man, it's good to see y'all. Good to see y'all. I missed y'all last week. I was able to, man, travel a little bit and just love on my boy and uh, be able to watch him grow and mature. Amen. Uh, but I thank God. Uh, for those of you who are online, some of you I can't wait to meet. And uh, those of you who are online, you know what I look like. I don't know what you look like. So if you see me in the airport, just yell out, what's up, hub? <laughs> right? I don't care where we are. Make sure you yell out because I want to meet you. I just want to get a chance to see you and, and get to know you and hear what God is doing in your life. Well, today uh, we have a unique privilege to, to lean into a challenging subject. Uh, to lean into a difficult subject, but to lean into a subject that we need to lean into. I mean, as you think about this last year, can we just be honest, last 15 months, hasn't it been a doozy? <laughs> Woo! Anybody just gonna be like, woosa. I mean, it's just last 16 months, and, <laughs> and it's not over. It's not over, it's not over. It's been a doozy. The last 16 months have been a doozy. We've gone through a lot. As I was reflecting upon that, reflecting upon uh, our time together, I've been pondering this for a while, had some conversations with people on the parking lot about this whole notion of trauma and this whole idea of being able to triumph. Triumph simply means victory. Can you say victory? Triumph simply means victory, being able to triumph over our Trauma, And I came across an article entitled, What Happens When Americans Can Finally Exhale? The subtitle is, The Pandemic's Mental Wounds Are Still Wide Open. It was in The Atlantic online. And the uh, writer basically just talks about that over the last 16 months, as a result of the pandemic, we've gone through a lot. Uh, we've experienced a lot. Trust in many instances within our culture has been eroded. Our ability to connect with one another has been challenged. We've been isolated. The author talks about that in many ways we've experienced globally trauma, that throughout the globe people have experienced trauma. They talk about in the article that trauma, uh, according to its primary definition by some, uh, requires that there actually be a threat to death or serious injury or some form of sexual violence. But then others say that an expanded definition of trauma should include things like life events or divorce or unemployment or other experiences that we may have. Think about it, over the last 16 months, at least 580,000 Americans have died from COVID-19. They talk about how in the article that for each person, there's an average of at least nine people that are connected to that person who have had to grieve the loss of that person, which would mean that there were five million people who are still grieving the loss of a loved one as a result of COVID-19. Talk about in the article, they're grieving the loss of a loved one in non-traditional ways. COVID even took away our rituals of grief. When we could come together and we could gather together for a funeral or a celebration of life and, and we could hug one another and everybody who wanted to come could come and share memories. During COVID, we weren't able to do that. You add to the pandemic, the stressors of unemployment. So many people were without jobs, are still without jobs. So many people are contemplating whether or not they're going to go back to work. So many of us were isolated. We were disconnected from family and friends, disconnected from our coworkers, and, and with the isolation came loneliness and a number of other challenges. Some of us were thrust into full-time parenting. We thought we were parents before, but we had never been the teacher before. 
Working and the teacher, right? <laughs> working and the recess person, right? Working and preparing lunches, and you still got to do what you have to do, and all of that it placed some stress upon us. And then you add to the pandemic situations and circumstances within our society, like the killing of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd and the many other acts of violence that uh, occurred against black and brown people over the last year and a half. Then you add to that. They talk about record wildfires during this season. You add to that insurrection on our nation's capital. You add to that the Texas power outage or crisis. You add to that mass shootings in Atlanta and in other places. The last 16 months have been a lot. And for many of us, we have yet to be able to just breathe a sigh of relief. Even as we're trying to move towards what we're calling post-pandemic life, our reality is that 600 people are still dying of COVID-19 every day. Our reality is we have yet to see the implications of everything that occurred during the pandemic. People are paying higher prices for wood, higher prices for chicken, Chicken wings, you can't get a chicken wing. Come on now. I mean, so much has occurred that has placed stress upon us. One writer, Jesse Gold of Washington University says, I think some people believe we press pause and we'll go back to the way things were before as if we didn't have all the intervening experiences as though 2020 didn't happen, and as though getting a vaccine will somehow erase our memories of grief and loss and isolation. We've been through trauma. That's on top of our normal trauma. So let me just throw out some different definitions of trauma. On the front end, let me tell you, I'll be heavy on information. On the back end, we'll lean into the scripture and hopefully it'll come all together. One definition of trauma, according to the American Psychological Association, is an emotional response to a terrible event like an accident, rape, or natural disaster. Another definition of trauma by Shelley Rambo, trauma is a modern way of describing how violence impacts us psychologically and emotionally. A pastoral theologian, Kerry Dorang, identifies trauma as a biopsycho-spiritual response to overwhelming life events. Cal J. Howard, a young brother, says that trauma is the result of physical, emotional, and or psychological pain that hunts a person through life rather than being contained to a specific moment in time. In short, he says, trauma is the result of being haunted perpetually, stuck in a moment of pain. Trauma, uh, according to the Biblical Counseling Association, is emotional distress caused by the recurrent tormenting memory of a horrific event witnessed or experienced. And then finally, Kyle Spears says, trauma is a stored experience that disrupts a person's mental or spiritual resistance, whether conscious or unconscious. We have a great resource here locally, and if, for those of you online, I pray that you would check into the resources that you have in your area to deal with trauma and help us to process, process trauma. Locally, we have OSF Hospital and Unity Point, and OSF Hospital has OSF Thrive, which focuses specifically in areas of trauma. They talk about traumatic events like gun violence within a community or assaults or domestic violence or armed violence. But then when you think about signs of trauma, because when we experience trauma, uh, there is one book that talks about our body keeps the score. When we experience trauma, trauma impacts us physically and emotionally and changes our behavior. So some of the physical signs of trauma is we have trouble eating or sleeping. We feel tense. We may clench our muscles, sometimes unknowingly. Uh, we have panic attacks, suddenly feeling scared. Or emotional signs may be that we're feeling numb 
numb or constantly in a daze or shocked. We're feeling scared, even in places that we used to feel safe in. We're feeling sad or helpless. We're having flashbacks or, or feeling like we're reliving the event or it changes our behavior. So to try to numb ourselves, we want to use drugs or alcohol or we avoid things that remind us or of the trauma or we struggle at work and struggle in relationships. We struggle with family and we struggle with friends. Those are some signs or symptoms of trauma. Another writer says that there are three types of trauma. There is acute trauma. This typically occurs because of a single distressing event. One thing happens, an accident, an assault that is physical or sexual, a natural disaster. One thing happens that impacts us in a way that threatens our livelihood or threatens our security. And as a result, we're experiencing trauma. There is chronic trauma where we're exposed multiple times over a period of time to something that is harmful or hurtful, serious illness or some other form of abuse, war. So we have a lot of people who deal with PTSD as a result of war and being a part of war, but extreme situations that are occurring consistently over time that have created within us this chronic trauma. And then there's complex trauma. Complex trauma is simply that you've had so many different traumatic experiences that it's created some layers in your head and your heart, in your thinking. It's, it's impacted you in so many ways that it's complex. It's important for us to talk about trauma because trauma wounds the soul. Trauma unsettles our faith and fosters doubt. Trauma causes us to raise questions like, is God God? If God is God, what really is his character like? Is God really faithful? Is God really good? I mean, because if he was good, then why did he allow this to happen to me? Does God have the capacity to keep me and protect me. It causes us to wrestle with our faith and wrestle with our understanding, our convictions, our belief about our God. One writer, Dr. Diane Lamberg, says that trauma mutilates hope, shatters faith, and turns the world upside down. And because we experience trauma in life, many of us in this room have experienced trauma. Trauma causes us to have triggers. Sometimes we have internal triggers, a memory or a physical sensation or an emotion that's an internal trigger that takes us back to that event or takes us back to that experience. Or sometimes there are external triggers, a person or a place or a specific situation that causes us to feel as though we're dealing with that experience or that event all over again. And trauma is real, and most of us, unfortunately, are familiar with trauma. Yet trauma is not a new thing. The scriptures tell us stories of human trauma that when you think about it, they could have been omitted from the scriptures, but instead, God left them on record. I mean, stories like how Joseph's brothers treated him when they plotted to kill him, but then sold him into slavery, but that was after badgering him, trauma. Stories like Judah and Tamar and her, her husband dying and then next husband dying and, and the promise that she would be able to marry, but being deceived and being tricked and being embarrassed within the community, trauma. Trauma like recorded in Judges 19, a, a Levite's concubine being assaulted again and again. Trauma like Amon, Amnon and Tamar. Tamar being raped by her brother in 2 Samuel 13. Trauma like Jonah's shipwreck. I mean, that would be traumatic to be in the belly of a fish. Or trauma like that parable that we love. The parable of the Good Samaritan. You know that's a parable of trauma. He was beaten assaulted and left for dead. That's a story of trauma or trauma like what we just celebrated in remembrance, the trauma of the cross. You do know that was a traumatic experience for Jesus to be beaten and whipped and then crucified. 
trauma is throughout the scriptures. Trauma, unfortunately, is a human reality that spans time, cultures, languages, and people groups. The human problem of sin shows itself in human expression that is often damaging, detrimental to others who are human beings. And Jesus didn't want us to be surprised, so Jesus tells his disciples and leaves it on record for us in John 16 and 33, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. You will have suffering, trouble, trauma in this world, but be courageous. I have conquered the world. The scriptures teach us that God is not surprised by humanity's experiences of trauma and that God can help us in the midst of our trauma. The message is about triumph over trauma. Triumph simply means Victory. Yes, trauma is a human reality, but we serve a God who has experience in helping people who have been broken or wounded experience healing and wholeness. Triumph is possible. We see the record in Psalm 147, which is where we want to anchor ourselves. And for those of you online, it's available on version. For those of you who are in person, your notes are available on version. Psalm 147 is a message of hope, but please understand that it's believed that Psalm 147 is, is written to the nation of Israel after they come back from exile. They come back from exile, which means that they were taken away from their home around 605. Babylonians invaded Judah, and they took away people like Daniel that we celebrate as we read in the Scriptures. And they took him to a foreign place, changed his name. They stripped him of his identity and stripped him of his culture. They continued to ravage the nation of Israel, conquered them in 597, and took another group of people out of their homeland, finally in 586, destroyed the Jerusalem temple, burned down the walls and the gates. They, they ravaged the city and took another group of people into a foreign land. Can you imagine somebody coming into your home, taking everything from your home, taking you from your home, and then taking you to a strange place and saying, this is your new home, but you won't be called by your old name. You'll be called by a new name. You can't operate the way you used to operate, can't eat what you used to eat, can't dress the way you used to dress, taking your family members and sending them wherever they want to send them exiled. And Psalm 147 is written to the nation of Israel after they come back from exile, after they come back from that traumatic experience where they were separated as families, after they come back from that traumatic experience where they had lost everything, lost their culture, lost their temple, lost their, their sense of worship and being able to be the people of God that God had called them to be. As they come back now to Jerusalem to rebuild, to start over again, Psalm 147 is written as a reminder to them that even though their pain is great, their God is greater. And I want to remind somebody today that even though your pain is great, your God is greater than your pain. Even though you've been through a lot, you've experienced a lot, a lot of hurt, a lot of heartache, a lot of betrayal, a lot of grief, you've lost a lot over the last 16 months, but truth be told, you were losing before 16 months showed up. You lost a lot, you've been grieving a lot, but God is greater than all that you've been through, and the God that we serve is able to heal our wounds. So Psalm 147 opens saying, hallelujah, how good it is to sing to our God for praise is pleasant and lovely. The Lord rebuilds Jerusalem. He gathers Israel's exiled people. The psalmist opens up by saying, I know it don't look like we should celebrate God. I know it doesn't look like we have a reason to praise him and bless him, but just think about it. Even though you've been through what you've been through, you've been through. I knew some of y'all would be slow on that. So for those of you who are online, you do know that through is in plus out. You've been through what you've been through, but through is in plus out. God has brought you out of it. 
You're still carrying the wounds of it, but he did bring you out of it. You've been through. So he says, praise God. Sing to his name. Bless him because he is a God who restores. So for a few moments, I just want to talk to us about this God who restores from verse 3. Because there are so many of us in here today who are dealing with trauma, so many online who are dealing with trauma, you haven't talked about it. And I'm praying for you now. I was praying for you before we started. But I want you to hear verse 3 of Psalm 147 that says, God heals the brokenhearted and he binds up or bandages their wounds. What I want you to hear if you're dealing with trauma, if you've experienced trauma, I want you to know, first of all, that God is concerned about you and your trauma. How do you know God is concerned about me and my trauma? The scripture says that he heals the broken hearted. The broken hearted literally means he, he heals the, those who have experienced a break, those who have experienced a break where it seems like their life has been shattered into pieces, but it's the broken hearted. It's not just the broken Physically, it's the broken hearted. Heart speaks to the inner life. He heals those who have been wounded on the inside. Those who, like a mirror, have been thrown to the ground and, and it seems like their insides have been cast into a whole bunch of pieces. Those who, because of the pain that they've gone through, their thinking has changed. Their emotions are unstable. Those who are unsettled because of the trauma that they've experienced, God heals the broken hearted, which means God knows about your broken hearted. God knows about your pain. God knows about the shattered pieces of your life, the things that you haven't been able to put back together again. God knows about it. God is concerned about you and your wounds. God knows that the trauma that you've been through has changed you. Because you can't go through trauma without trauma changing you. See, there's no such thing, one writer says, as going back to your pre-trauma self. No, once you've been through trauma, trauma forever changes you. After you've gone through trauma, you either get stuck in your trauma or you go forward from your trauma. But God is concerned because he knows that the trauma has changed you, it's changed you on the inside, it's changed how you think, it's changed how you look at people, it's changed how you deal with people, it's changed how you deal with circumstances, it's changed how you interact with God, it's changed how you pray, it's changed how you manage your life, it's changed how you see yourself. When you look at yourself, it's like you're looking at a broken mirror. And when you look at a broken mirror, it look and you see yourself broken into pieces. It's changed everything about you. God cares and God is concerned about you and your trauma because not only does he know that the trauma has changed you, but God knows that the trauma stays in your body. God knows that it stays with you. That's why we have triggers because our body remembers the experience. Our body remembers the events and our body begins to respond to those experiences and events. God knows that it remains with you and because God knows that it remains in you, God wants to be able to heal that broken hearted so that he can move you to a place of resolve. I want you to know first of all that God is concerned about you and your trauma. I don't care what you've been through. I don't care how long ago you've been through it. Please hear that God is concerned. Not only is God concerned, but secondly, I want you to hear that God can heal your brokenness. I knew that would be harder. That would be harder. That would be harder. That, 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 that word for healed there is that word Rapha. We talk about God being Jehovah Rapha or Yahweh Rapha. He is the God who heals. He is the God who brings together. He is the God who makes whole. God can heal your brokenness. I know it seems like your life has been shattered into a thousand pieces, and I know you've been carrying these wounds for a long time, but please know that God can heal your brokenness, but healing is a process. 
Did you read the, the text? God heals. Not God healed, but God heals. Healing is a process because everything on the inside has been wounded and everything on the inside has been impacted and affected. God has to do some deep work. Healing is a process, and oftentimes healing is a painful process. If, if the truth were told for some who have been going through the healing process of their trauma, healing is an exhausting process. It takes a toll on you for God to begin to do the deep work to address the thinking that has come as a result of the trauma, to address the emotional stuff that has come as a result of the trauma, to address the spiritual components that have come as a result of the trauma. It is a process and it's exhausting, but God is committed to the process. See, God can heal your broken heart in this, but it's a process. And, and please hear this second sub point. Not only is healing a process, but healing is a spiritual and therapeutic process. There is a part for us to do, but there is a part that only God can do. Healing is a both and process, not an either or process. It's Jesus and a therapist. Help me, somebody. It's Jesus and a counselor, Jesus and a psychologist. I don't trust Jesus any less. I just need some tools to help me work through this thing. I, I need somebody to give me some stuff in my toolbox so when the triggers rise up, I know how to manage that thing and work through that thing. It's a both and, not either or. And I know many of us have have unfairly put extra trauma on you by saying, just pray about it. You ain't prayed about it. Just pray about it and trust God. God's going to work it out. God is going to work it out. But when you have a heart attack, you don't just pray about it. You get your butt to the hospital. When you got high blood pressure, you don't just pray about it. You go see the doctor and you get you some, some medicine. When you're dealing with cancer, you don't just pray about it. You go meet a doctor and you go through the process to get treatment. The same thing occurs with trauma. We don't just pray. We're going to pray and we're going to go meet with some people who can help to give us some tools so that we can begin with God's help to See the pieces come back together again. Healing is a process. And because so many areas of us on the inside have been wounded and broken and hurt and harmed, it's a process that takes time. It's a process that's both and. It's a process that requires us having some support. When you've been through trauma, God is going to heal those of us who are brokenhearted, and God is going to use some other people who have some skills to help us, but God also uses some people to support us. It's all right. I'm going to preach it anyway. You need some people in your life who will ask, when is the last time you saw your therapist? When is the last time you had a counselor such? Are you doing what they told you to do? Are you utilizing the tools that they gave you? Are you working through some mindfulness? Are you doing some journaling? Are you reframing and rewiring? Are you working through the tools that they gave you? And if not, to say, if you don't, I'm picking you up. Now, what's the next time you have an appointment? I'll be there to go with you to your appointment. Why? Because God wants to do the healing, but it's work. And I need to encourage you, even though it's painful, to do the work. So I just wanted to let us know that God is concerned about our trauma. God can heal our brokenheartedness. But finally, please hear that healing is not the removal of trauma, but the transformation of trauma. Please hear it. Please hear it. I would love for God to just take it away. Anybody else online, you say, man, I, I would love for that, right? But, but, but that's not what he says. 
He heals the brokenhearted, and he binds their wounds. Binds their wounds, they would have taken some medicine and put it with some, some bandages or something to apply it to the wound so that the wound could heal. The wounds are not erased. They remain, but, but there's a healing process. He, he binds up their wounds, and he binds up their wounds, and there's a, a healing process, and the healing process is slow, and oftentimes after you've had wounds that have healed, you still have scars. And the scars are a reminder that something happened there. When the scars are fresh, if somebody bumps it, you're like, oh. Sometimes even after it heals, they touch it, and something inside of you says it should hurt, but then you remind yourself, but it didn't hurt. But, but it's the power of the scars. Scars are visible reminders that we have stories to tell. He heals the brokenhearted. He binds up their wounds. And, and, and as we are being healed and the wounds are being bound, it may leave some scars. But the scars are reminders that there is a story that, that, that yes, I did go through that in plus out. But God did some work on me and God did some work in me and it took a long time for me to get where I am because he's still healing my broken heartedness and he's still binding up my wounds but I thank God I'm not where I used to be I'm further along I, I used to wouldn't tell you nothing about the trauma I've been through but I've gotten to a place where my scars remind me of the story so I I gotta tell the story when I talk about the scar because you don't know all that I been through but what I been through has helped me to understand God and helped me to understand myself and as I share with you what I been through it might encourage you to know that the same God that brought me through can bring you through I still have the scars but God is bringing me through I'm done but this this messed me up when I when I thought about it we just celebrated Jesus crucified on the cross, placed in a borrowed tomb, raised from the dead. And after he was raised from the dead, he went to see the disciples. And anybody remember what Thomas said? Thomas who wasn't there, he says, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I want to see him, but, but I'm not going to believe unless I can see for myself where they put the nails. I, I, I want to see the evidence of what he what he been through. I want to I want to see the evidence that it's the same person that now, now, now think about it. Jesus could have in his resurrected body, with his resurrected body, not had the evidence of what he'd been through. But it's it's something about the scars that bore witness to Thomas that that this is the same Jesus that was crucified, the same Jesus that was placed in a borrowed tomb, the same Jesus that got up on the third day. It's the same Jesus, and it was something about the scars that bore witness to Thomas that Jesus was who he said he is. Brothers and sisters, God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. And strangely enough, God uses the stories of our scars to be a blessing sometimes to other folk. Please hear what I'm not saying, and forgive me if I have said this before. I am not saying that God allowed you to go through that so you can have the story. I am not saying that. But I am saying that God knew you would go through it. And God's healing of you provides the opportunity for you to use the story. And many of us who are listening today have some trauma. And I know some of you are saying to yourself, Pastor, I'm just curious, how in the world did you get to a point where you decided that you were going to preach on trauma on July 4th. How did that happen? 
I mean, it seems so random that you would, that you would preach on that on July 4th. It's not random. When I thought of July 4th, I thought of generational trauma. It's not random. I, when I thought of July 4th, the celebration of our nation's independence, I, I thought about the fact that I have a complicated relationship with my nation. That's what I thought about. I, I, I thought about that, that, that it was complicated because, because I was able to celebrate Juneteenth in a way that I, I'm not able to celebrate July 4th. I just thought about it, it was complicated. It's, it was generational trauma that rose up on the inside of me. And I started dealing with some stuff that I needed to deal with to say, God, but you brought us through. We still got scars, but you brought us through. So I'm going to celebrate because I thank you that you allowed me to be in this country, but my relationship is complicated. That's how we got to trauma. And I thank God that we're a diverse congregation. I thank God, I thank God, I thank God. I thank God that we're not just a black congregation, but we have all colors in our congregation, people from different places in our congregation. And a part of our growing as a congregation is learning to love one another, respect one another, and hear me and acknowledge one another's pain. That's what it's about. It's about grieving with those who grieve and rejoicing with those who rejoice. My prayer as a community of faith, whether you're online, St. Paul, everywhere or in person, is that as a community, we would become more aware of trauma because people in our community are dealing with all kinds of trauma. And my prayer is that as we become aware of it, that we would be better not only loving God, but loving our neighbors as ourselves. So as I pray, Father, I thank you for you being a God that heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. I thank you for the healing that you've done in my life because of trauma. Thank you for the changes that you've made. Things that I can now talk about that I used to couldn't talk about. And I know it was nobody but you. I thank you for the people that you placed in my life. The counselors who helped me to process the pain to sort it all out by your grace, to be able to think differently, to not be controlled by trauma, but to experience triumph over trauma. And I'm trusting you to do the same thing for others that you have done for me. I'm trusting you to be at work in our lives as we bring to you some of the hard stuff that we've been through. We begin a journey of allowing you to heal because you care, because you're concerned, because you have power to heal, to allow you to bandage our wounds, knowing that our scars will have a story. And we just want to tell how the gospel story has made us whole. So Jesus, thank you that you still have the scars. When we see you again, you'll still have the nail prints in your hand. Thank you for the scars that tell stories. So we love you. We pray for those who have been wounded and broken and bruised they would discover hope in Jesus the Christ. Help us as we take this step because you are the God who can make all things new. So work we pray in Jesus' name.